right now in this module we are going to uh, learn the basics of uh, tie sapphire laser what is there inside and uh, how to use it but before that this is what we have learned and this is where we ended the last module we talked about curl lens mode locking curl lens mode locking means because of the uh, gaussian distribution of a tem00 mode you have greater intensity at the center of the beam and it falls off as it go towards the edge this brings in an intensity dependent refractive index which sort of acts like a lens it's called a curl lens and since uh, pulse light so it focuses the intense beams and uh, does not focus beams that are less intense and since pulse light is intrinsically uh, more intense what this curl lensing does is that it can select pulse light over cw light you can do it actively by putting in an aperture in the path of the beam but that's not even required the optics usually take care of it this is what we said and this is how pulses are produced so femtosecond pulses are produced by curl lens mode locking without us having to do much uh, in subsequent modules we are going to talk about active mode locking where we have to introduce something and uh, get the mode locking done that is uh, we have to use something called uh, acousto optic device but here that is not even required thermal lensing takes care of it and of course why is it that we get femtosecond pulses and not uh, picosecond pulses by thermal lensing because in femtosecond pulses intensity is much more right you are mode locking many more pulses many more modes are locked that is why pulse width is so small so this is what you can get by curl lens mode locking if you want picosecond pulses and nanosecond pulses you have to do something okay we said that this is the advantage of curl lens mode locking it produces pulses disadvantage of curl lens mode locking is that it also brings in sharp which effectively is going to broaden the pulse so before we can think of making a laser we have to correct for this sharp and how do you correct for this sharp the answer is very simple once again you can go back to this uh, analogy of computation right so we uh, i enter a running race with tanuja all of you agreed that tanuja is going to win hands down because she is a faster runner but i don't want that i want to reach the end point at the same time as tanuja even though i am a slower runner so if i am powerful enough what will i do i'll make her run more and i'll run less i'll take a shortcut i'll not let her take a shortcut right so uh, difference in speed has to be uh, compensated for by altering path length okay it's that simple and that is what is done to compensate for sharpening what you have to do is whichever path whichever light is leading has to go through a longer path the frequencies that are trailing have to go through a uh, shorter path okay and this is done quite easily by using a uh, prism pairs in fact it is enough to use one prism pair i'm going to show you uh, an arrangement using uh, two prisms but what is more common and what we have inside the laser we use is two pairs of prism and the job of this prism is to do a compensation for what is called group velocity dispersion what's the meaning of group velocity dispersion the uh, separation in time of different frequencies due to different uh, velocities in a medium with a finite refractive index that is called group velocity dispersion we are trying to compensate for it okay so what do you do say uh, you have a sharp pulse that has gone in you can see the sharp right here the wavelengths are more here the wavelengths are shorter greater frequency on this side lesser frequency on this side okay so you make it go through a prism okay everybody knows what happens when it goes through a prism it gets dispersed okay then introduce in the path of the light another prism which is uh, facing opposite and the angles have to be same then what will happen is look at this path what is this color on this side on the top 
یا گرین ریڈ واٹ از دی کلر ایٹ دا باٹم یلو سو واٹ وی آر شوئنگ ہیئر از دیٹ ریڈ ہیز ٹریول لیس اینڈ یلو ہیز ٹریول مور دین یو پٹ دس دین اٹ ول بیکم اے کالیمیٹیڈ بین اینڈ آئی شو یو ان اے مومنٹ وائی واٹ دی ایڈوانٹیج آف یوزنگ ٹو پریزم پیئر از اوکے اینڈ دین اٹ گوز ٹو اینڈ ادر پریزم پیئر دین اگین دے آر براڈ ٹوگیدر اینڈ اٹ گوز آؤٹ ایز اے بین سو ہیئر دی انہیرنٹ ایزامشن از دیٹ دا لائٹ مارکڈ ان ریڈ از ٹریلنگ اینڈ دا لائٹ مارکڈ ان یلو از لیڈنگ سو وی ہیو گیون اے بگر پاتھ لینتھ ٹو دی یلو بیم یلو آئی ایم ناٹ سینگ یلو کلر دی کلر دیر ہیو یوز ٹو ڈپک دا بیم ہیئر اینڈ آئی ہیو گیون اے اسمالر پاتھ لینتھ ٹو دی فریکوینسی دیر ہیو ڈپکٹیڈ ان ریڈ اوکے سو اف ریڈ واز ٹریلنگ وتھ ریسپیکٹ ٹو یلو ان دس ریجن دین دیٹ ووڈ بی کمپنسیٹیڈ فار ہیو یو انڈرسٹ سو دس از ہاؤ جی وی ڈی ڈسپرشن از ڈن آر یو کلیئر ناؤ واٹ از دی ایڈوانٹیج آف یوزنگ ٹو پریزم پیئرز انسٹیڈ آف ون دی ایڈوانٹیج از یو کین ہیو ٹیونیبلٹی ہاؤ ڈو یو ہیو ٹیونیبلٹی اینڈ دس واٹ وی ہیو ان آور سونامی لیزر وین وی اوپن اٹ اپ دا نیکسٹ ڈے وی آر گوئنگ ٹو شو اٹ سونامی لیزر اور ان مینی ادر لیزرس وچ آر ٹیونیبل واٹ یو ڈو از یو انٹروڈیوس انٹروڈیوس اے سلیٹ ان دس پورشن دیٹ از وائی یو ریکوائر اے کالیمیٹیڈ بیم ادر وائز ول بی ویری ڈیفیکلٹ ٹو کیلیبریٹ اوکے سپوز یو ہیو دس سلیٹ ان دس ریجن دین دس پارٹ آف دا لائٹ از گوئنگ ٹو گو تھرو ادر پارٹ ول بی بلاکڈ اوکے سو دیٹ ول بی دا ماڈل ویو لینتھ اف آئی موو دا سلیٹ I made some animation, but I think I have goofed it up. But I think you can understand. If, if I move the slit, uh, the way it is drawn here, vertically, I bring it down, then the light that is uh, depicted in yellow will go through to a greater extent. Move it up, light that is depicted in red will go through to a greater extent. This is how we get tunability. And I'm going to show the picture of a laser at least today. There we'll see uh, how we do it. And when you open it up, we'll see it even better. Okay, this is the advantage. If you use only one prism pair, then it is difficult to get, have tunability. Then it is whatever the system gives you, the spectral maximum. But advantage of using two prism pairs is, in addition to uh, compensating for GVD, you can have a tunable output. Okay, right. Now, the laser that we use in our laboratory is a titanium sapphire laser. What is the meaning of a titanium sapphire laser? Sapphire, I think we discussed earlier. What is sapphire? What is sapphire to a chemist and what is sapphire to a uh, layman? To a layman, a sapphire is a precious stone, right? You uh, make a pendant out of it or you uh, wear it on a ring. To a chemist, what is sapphire? Aluminum oxide with some doping, right? So here the doping is titanium. So you can read how it is made. It's a titanium oxide, aluminum oxide melted together and so on and so forth with a particular level of doping. Now, aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide is the uh, matrix. It is a titanium ion that is the actual active ingredient. Uh, there can be other depictions of the energy levels, but this is one that is there in tsunami manual and this is what uh, describes the system fairly well. Ground state is a doublet T2G, excited state is a doublet EG, okay? And when you excite, you excite, use, I'm going to show you the, the uh, spectra, you excite at uh, say 530 nanometer or so, you can excite there. But then post excitation, there's an ultra fast relaxation to the zeroth vibrational level and this is where the uh, emission occurs from. And you can see that the equilibrium bond lengths, were, well, the minima, minima of the two potential energy surfaces, not a good idea to talk about bond lengths right now, but minima of the potential energy surfaces are not in the same position, right? So, when the emission takes place from here, this is where you reach. So, this energy gap is more or less 800 nanometer equivalent. 
that is why you excite using green light and you get what they have called uh, IR light. You see it better in this absorption and emission spectrum, right. So, you can see absorption spectrum is more or less from 400 nanometer to 650 nanometer. The, the maximum is somewhere near 500, 550 that region. Emission starts at 600 nanometer, maximum is at about 800 nanometer and it goes all the way up to 1050 nanometer or so. So, this is uh, what you get to play with. You can excite anywhere here and you can get emission anywhere here. Usually one uses a 532 nanometer excitation because that is a very robust laser that is already available. Nuvidium YEL or Nuvidium uh, YAG laser, okay. That is that technology is so robust that uh, it does not make sense to try to pump with anything else and in any case it more or less matches the absorption maximum. Okay. So, that is your pump laser. Pumping is CW in this case. You do not, we are going to talk later on about uh, cases where pumping is by a pulse laser, but not in case of a titanium sapphire oscillator. Pumping is by CW green laser. Okay. And this is where the emission takes place. Now, looking at this diagram, the energy level diagram, can you tell me what kind of a uh, system is it? Is it a 2 level, 3 level, or 4 level system? Four level system. What kind of output do we expect from a four level system? Continuous wave, right. So, intrinsically you expect titanium sapphire laser to give you CW output and it does. Mode locking takes place because of your uh, car lens effect and so on and so forth. Now, with that background, let me show you one of the earliest successful designs of a titanium sapphire laser. This is called the Marnen Captain design. Captain and Marnen are uh, two professors of I think University of Colorado at Boulder, but they have for a long time now launched a company which is quite successful, not so much in India, but across the world. It is called KM Labs and claim to fame of KM Labs was this kit that they used to sell at one point of time where you have everything that you require to build an oscillator and you are supposed to put it together and uh, make a tisophile laser yourself. That kit is still uh, is available once again on demand. Uh, this is a very simple design, but uh, it takes a bigger space. So, this captain one and laser uh, takes up uh, say 2 feet by 2 feet kind of space on the laser table leaving out the pump laser. So, a squarish kind of design. So, this is how it works pump laser comes in and then so you see uh, one thing that we will say without uh, going into much detail here is that for solid state lasers pumping has to be coaxial. For dye lasers it is ok if the axis of lasing is this and you pump like this not so for uh, solid state lasers. So, pumping has to be more or less along the same line, same axis along which lasing takes place. So, that is achieved always and I am going to show you uh, the ray diagram of our own uh, tisophile laser later. That is always used by using one mirror that is uh, your uh, dichroic. Allows green light to go through, does not allow red light to go through. So, this M3 mirror that is shown here it is a dichroic mirror. Green light goes straight through, in fact, even M2 and uh, red light is deflected. Okay. So, this is your pump from uh, 532 nanometer, typically 4 watt, 5 watt, 3 watt, whatever it is, CW. It is focused on the laser rod, the titanium sapphire rod, which is shown here as a red trapezium. Okay. And then emission from this laser rod is captured by these two mirrors. These are con concave mirrors I hope you can see and then they are focused back onto the rod. So, see we talked about card lens mode locking. So, this is what sustains a uh, mode locked uh, operation even without using a uh, 
using your uh, an aperture. Because something it, the mirrors are aligned in such a way that they are exactly focused where this pulse beam is supposed to get focused. So, anything that is not focusing will not be in the axis of lazy. That is how CW is gotten rid of. Sometimes there is a little bit of CW contamination, you have to play around with the optics and get rid of it. Okay. So, now let us go one by one. Let us take uh, M2 to start with. Okay. M2 catches this, focuses it here and then it goes this side goes through a prism pair. You see here in this design, there is only one prism pair. What does it mean? You do not have tunability. Then it goes and hits M4, which is a plane mirror and it hits M4 exactly at right angle. So, then it is sent back. It retraces its path, it is focused here. From M2, it goes to M1. Again, M1 is a uh, plane mirror and then it goes to an output coupler, which is a partially reflecting mirror through which you get uh, the laser out. Okay. Quite a simple design, not very difficult to make, provided you have all the distances right. And then the reason why Captain Martin kit became such a hit is that uh, everything was specified. So, just it was like Lego, you have to put things together in the right place and you have your laser. And uh, to Always titanium sapphire laser starts operation in uh, CW mode because it is 4 level laser, right. So, you have to bring in some kind of disturbance in the cavity and that is what kick starts the pulsed operation. So, the way in which, so well, uh, I should say that this figure is from PhD thesis of DS English, who is a professor in somewhere in the US right now, I forgot where, exactly where, uh, and I have used this laser as a postdoc. So, what we would do is we would uh, tap a mirror. It is an open laser you know, unlike what we now use. So, you go and tap a mirror like this or just disturb the mirror a little bit and then mode locking is done. Okay. What we have in our lab looks significantly more complicated. In fact, if you look at the manual, it looks even more complicated because other uh, components are included there. I have that is what took a lot of time today. I had to erase all those things that we do not have. Let us see if we can understand uh, the optical layout of the uh, spectrophysics tsunami laser that we use in our lab. Other lasers from coherent and other places have more or less uh, similar layout, but every company has its own design. So, here we will spend a little time on this because we want to understand exactly why uh, what each component does. So, you have the pump beam coming in from here from the left. Okay. There is a Brewster window when we talk about uh, nonlinear optics, we will discuss Brewster effect. It goes in. So, this is the entry point of your uh, tsunami laser. Okay. Go straight P1 means P for pump, P1 is a green reflecting mirror. So, that so, P1 as you see is a uh, plane mirror, goes to P2 which is a focusing mirror because your pump beam also has to be focused at the uh, crystal for optimal operation. P2 a curved mirror, concave mirror, then see it is going through M3 for the same reason that uh, I discussed when we talked about uh, Captain Martin design. M3 again is a dichroic mirror, allows green to go through, reflects red and it is see it is more or less coaxial. So, it goes, hits dry sapphire rod and then it goes straight, I am talking to the pump beam now, pump beam goes through M2 which is again a dichroic mirror and then there is a beam dump that is where it hits and then it has no further role. From this dry sapphire rod emission takes place. Once again similar to Captain Martin design, you have two mirrors M2 and M3 and here you have the high reflector M1, plane mirror. The job of plane mirror is to just send it back, send the beam back and make it retrace its path. Then from there it goes through M3, M4 which is a plane mirror, 
m5 which is a plane mirror and then we it goes through what we have discussed already two pairs of prism. What is the job of two pairs of prism? GVD, GVD compensation and this here is the tuning slit. In the portion where the beam is uh, collinear. Okay. So, basically when you change color using a micrometer screw gauge you move this slit up and down this is actually vertical. Then M8, M9 well this is the prism pair this M8, M9 are actually increasing the length between P3 and P4 well PR3 and PR4. Then there is something called acoustoptic modulator hold on we will come back to it and then it goes to uh, your output coupler okay? and then it goes straight. There is something called beam splitter here and fast photodiode here we will see what they do. But before that suppose you have a tsunami laser here of course uh, we have not had much problem over the last 12 years that we have had it. But suppose your laser is not lazing it has happened once or twice how do you get it to laze and this is true not only for a tie sapphire laser any laser whose cavity you have access to. How do you make it laze? Generally you do not have to do much with the pump beam, but you must ensure that the pump beam is horizontal. In any good alignment all beams have to be horizontal unless for some design purpose they have to go like this. Otherwise horizontality is very very important. And here you can see why it has to be horizontal. If it is anything but horizontal, the entire path gets messed up. Okay. So, uh, horizontality of pump beam is an issue. Then, okay, now tie sapphire emission is there. It is not lazy, you put in a card there, you will see the fluorescence on the card, provided your eyes are not as bad as mine. You have to be able to see red nicely. Okay. So, you can, there are two arms, is not it? One arm towards M2, one arm towards M3. First thing to do is falls on M2, hits M, M1 and comes back right. You have to ensure that M1 is aligned in such a way that the beam retraces its path. How do you do that? You take a white card and punch a hole in it right. Hold the card in this beam and make sure that the beam goes through while coming from M2 to M1. Now, when it goes back let us say this is the hole in the card. This is how the beam goes from M2 to M1 hits M1 comes back. Now, if it is not going to if it is not retracing its path it will hit here or here. So, you can see it on the card. Then you have to play around with controls of M1 so that it goes through this right. Then this M1 M2 segment is aligned. You have to do the same thing here because fluorescence that is captured by M2 has to retrace its path while going back to the crystal. And of course, you understand the moment you touch M2 not only is the tie sapphire rod to M2 alignment changed, M1 M2 alignment will also get changed. So, uh, you might have to do it more than once several times do the same thing on this side and then see the beam goes this way and comes back. So, once again you have to take your card with a hole somewhere here between M3 and M4, play around with M4 control and make sure that your uh, light going in this direction and this direction travel in the same path. When that is done you take out the card you will see lazy. This is something that Unfortunately, we do not have to do on a daily basis anymore. I am saying unfortunately because once you do it, you become an expert in alignment. If you do not do it, it is a black box and uh, if you ever have to do it somewhere, it requires a little bit of practice. Of course, now as we are going to show at the end of this module, things have become uh, toys, you cannot do anything. So, maybe that scale is not even required anymore. This is what the laser looks like and again we are going to go to the lab and see it. We have seen it once already. See what you have is this is the side through which the pump beam enters. 
no sorry this is the side through which the pump beam enters from outside you just see some controls okay in our laser we don't even have this birefringent filter wavelength selector this is a generic diagram we have these two knobs what are these two knobs these are vertical and horizontal controls of the high reflector which one is the high reflector this one right so this blue and green knobs that are there green is for earth horizontal blue is for sky vertical so these are horizontal and vertical controls of the high reflector that is what one usually plays around with in the other end we have similar controls for the output coupler generally we don't touch it because the moment you touch both you are sort of shifting the beam completely and uh, if you are not careful it can get misaligned but sometimes we do have to touch output coupler because condition of the lab can change from time to time okay we don't have this gti dispersion thingy we do have these two micrometer controls here one for prism dispersion compensation one for wavelength selection what are these two micrometer controls one of them changes the distance between the prisms so when you change the distance between the prism you are essentially changing the uh, path difference among the different modes the other one moves the slit up and down okay so uh, by moving the slit up and down you select the uh, wavelength the modal wavelength and by playing around with the distance between prisms that is how you maximize gvd compensation and ensure that you get a good uh, optimal pulse okay now there are some problems with this tsunami kind of laser one problem is that the cavity is not sealed so if your lab is not absolutely dust free dust can get in and spoil your optics so regular cleaning might be required fortunately that's not the case in our case and for that's not the case for almost all ultra fast labs in india so nobody would invest so much in a laser and uh, keep it in a dirty room but there's another problem of the cavity being not sealed the problem is that uh, no matter how much you try you cannot have uh, a room that is absolutely dry your relative humidity we use humidifiers and all but at most we can go down to 40% it is important that we go down to 40% but then you can try and use in industrial humidifier and go down to say maybe 15% but that's not good for your health nose bleeds have been reported in labs where too much of dry atmosphere was maintained so some moisture will be there okay even if it is 14% and uh, water absorbs in the region of 950 nanometer onwards so if you are going to tune it then you don't want moisture in the cavity so tuning tunable range is severely affected by the presence of moisture so in a tsunami kind of laser if you want to uh, go up to say 1000 nanometer output then there's no way other than purging the entire cavity with dry nitrogen and we have done it a couple of times and i don't want to do it ever again the one nitrogen cylinder gets over in one day you do one day's experiment the cylinder is always on right and it's an open cavity nitrogen is going out so it's first of all it's cumbersome and secondly it's very highly nitrogen intensive i don't want to do it so because of these problems and also the other issue is technology is moving in a direction where everything has to become a black box the user should not worry about how things are of course the purpose of our course is exactly opposite but that is how things work now you are a biologist working on uh, two photon microscopy you don't really want to know about modes of lasers and how they are uh, coupled and so on and so forth so this is the state of the art and we have shown this already when we went to uh, the tcspc lab earlier So everything is uh, sealed in a container advantage of this is that you can have full range of tunability 
690 nanometer to 1050 nanometer at the click of a mouse. Disadvantage is anything goes wrong inside this. The laser has to go back to the factory because it is hermetically sealed. It cannot be opened anywhere other than the factory where uh, humidity, temperature, everything, uh, well, uh, air quality, everything is maintained uh, very rigorously. Okay. And the qu question that one uh, that should come to one's mind, and this is actually a laser in which you have the pump laser on one side and you have the tie sapphire laser on the other side. Now, we should have a question when we see this. This here is the laser driver. Why we had said earlier that you need some kind of a cavity length to have pulsed operation, okay. round trip time and so on and so forth. So, in such a small thing, how is cavity length maintained? And that is the diagram I was looking for and unfortunately didn't find this morning. If I find it, I will include it in the presentation and upload. So, what you have there is that you have this tisophyre crystal and you have two large mirrors. And the alignment is such that the light bounces off these mirrors many, many times. So, even though the separation between the two mirrors is not much, the effective path length is the same as what it is in tsunami. That is how uh, compact sealed lasers like MITAI work. Okay. So, what we have done today is we have started with uh, principle of mode locking, recurrent lens mode locking. And we have given you a little bit of idea about construction of lasers. We have not talked about certain things yet. One is if you remember that uh, diagram, we have not told you what the fast photodiode does. We have not told you what the meaning of AOM is. So, in the next module, in the next module, we are going to go to the lab, open up tsunami and show you. After that, we are going to talk about what acoustic optic modulators are, how they can produce uh, pulse picker, uh, how they can produce uh, uh, pulsed operation. I told you already that you do not really need acoustic optic modulator in this cavity. Why is it still there? It is still there because there is this technology called regenerative mode lock and we will discuss that after we have talked about acoustic optic modulators. And we will also talk about electro optic modulators like Pockel cell, which can give you uh, not short pulses, but large pulses. But in this context, which are useful in switching the uh, laser pulse out, outside the cavity. Once we are done with this discussion, we will talk about how amplification of laser is done and then we will talk about optical parametric amplification. Okay. So much for today.